Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Matt Cannon, and uh, welcome to the Tomcat Center uh, Spring Innovation Showcase. Um, I'm really happy to uh, see a great turnout today and uh, really excited to introduce you to our presenters very shortly. Uh, let me just give a quick uh, primer to this event for, for those of you who may be uh, joining a showcase for the first time. Uh, so this is our actually our fifth uh, innovation showcase, uh, and in these events we feature uh, three teams who are uh, early stage startup companies, um, and they have they have two things in common. Right? So the the first is that their their business and their product uh, has the potential to have a, a major impact on energy uh, or sustainability, uh, and the second is that. Uh, they have uh, been part of the Tomcat Center uh, Innovation Transfer Program here at Stanford University. Um, if you're not familiar with that program, uh, I would really encourage you to, to check out our website. Uh, basically, we support um, innovators in the Stanford community, students, uh, staff, faculty, uh, who nucleate around uh, innovation or an invention with the potential to impact uh, energy and sustainability and uh, seek to commercialize that through creating a new venture. Um, I, th I think the, the numbers really speak for themselves. Uh, it's been a very successful program. It's been going on for about nine years. We've supported over 90 teams, um, the vast majority of which are uh, startup companies in various stages, um, developing uh, amazing products that impact uh, a, a very broad spectrum of, uh, of really important problems. So, so please check that out. You can find a link. I will put a link up uh, in, the, in the chat if you want to learn more. Uh, so today we're going to hear a, uh, a brief presentation, about 10 minute presentation from each team. Um, and then there'll be time for, uh, for Q&A, about five minutes for Q&A. Um, we really have, have two goals. So, so one is uh, really to, to hear from our teams and to be uh, inspired by, by what they're doing. Uh, and the other is to, to make connections. Uh, so I would encourage you to, to put questions in the chat as you, um, as you listen to the, the presentations. Uh, I, will, I will do my best to accommodate questions, but, uh, but very often what happens is that the, uh, the presenters can, can follow up with you and, uh, and hopefully that leads to a, a further conversation. So we, we really wanna make uh, connections uh, as much as, as possible. So our, uh, our teams today are, are tackling um, uh, three very different areas with three very different technologies. Uh, so we have the, the cold chain, uh, wireless charging, and uh, nature-based carbon removal. Um, we'll start with the cold chain, uh, and the team is called uh, Arctic. It's Hannah Sieber and Mark Langer. Um, Arctic designs and manufactures um, reusable battery powered uh, cold chain shipping and storage containers that offer a, a more sustainable alternative to refrigerants and can uh, reduce spoilage uh, across many different value chains and in, in several different industries. Um, just a sort of a fun fact to prime the, uh, the presentation here. Um, a recent study of uh, grocery stores found that 86% of their scope one and scope two greenhouse gas emissions uh, come from uh, refrigerants and, and energy use associated with that. Uh, so Hannah and Mark, thanks so much for joining us and I'll turn it over to you. Awesome, thank you so much uh, for being here. Um, so just a quick introduction to us. Uh, I'm Hannah. I'm wrapping up my MBA and my master's in environmental resources at Stanford. And prior to this, uh, I ran a different company in the energy storage space. Uh, Mark here is an electrical computer engineer from Carnegie Mellon. Uh, and together we have about two decades experience in, in transportation and logistics, which is what ultimately gave us the initial insight into this market. So a little bit about how the cold chain works today. The cold chain or any product that is temperature sensitive and needs to stay at temperature all the way from a factory, through planes, trains, cold warehouses, all the way to an end user. In fact, most products need to stay within one degree Celsius stability through this entire chain. And what happens is things spoil. Things might spoil because of mechanical failures, 
because of labor shortages, because of increasing natural disasters, or just because of human error. But what that means is that products spoil all across the value chain. To put this in perspective, in the medical field, two to 10% of medical goods spoil or $35 billion of losses. In agriculture, that number is even higher. 17% of post-harvest produce spoils are almost 60 billion globally. One in two medical products is expected to ship via the cold chain next year. And if we move that spoilage from 17% down to 1%, we would actually feed another billion people on the agricultural side. But in addition to the economic impacts, the climate impacts are massive. According to the most recent IPCC report, refrigeration will be the largest cause of greenhouse gases within the next decade. And when you take refrigeration and food waste, we're talking about 160 gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalent emissions. So as we start to think about how we address this industry, there's, there's sort of three main points here. First off, this is a hugely growing industry been relatively stagnant for about the last two decades. And then obviously with a lot of growth in um, you know, direct to consumer grocery shipments and in medical and biopharma investments, you, where it was a 23 year over year uh, uh, growth in the industry. And ultimately what we're, we're really coming up against is the fact that this is a very CapEx intensive industry, which is point number two. Um, demand is outpacing supply. We've talked to a number of different customers where you know, if, even if you're, you know, a large company that's doing grocery shipments, you literally can't find a warehouse that has any more uh, availability to, you know, store your goods, to hold on to them in sort of a depot configuration before you ship directly to the store. That really de depends highly on you investing a lot more CapEx expenditure on creating that infrastructure. So currently that means you have to buy refrigerated truck trailers, you have to buy, you know, heavy duty freezers, usually walk-in freezers um, for the, your warehouses or even pull the entire warehouse in certain instances. So you've got a lot of CapEx costs in order to make that work. Um, and then also as uh, Matthew was pointing out and, and you know, is also relevant across industries, um, emissions are becoming really important. You know, uh, reporting is, an, is important, not just in, in order to meet, um, you know, internal, uh, uh, mandates in terms of emission standards, but also externally in terms of uh, signaling to consumers that companies are doing the right thing for the environment. And we've seen this sort of across the board, even in very high polluting industries such as uh, airliner airlines, where the companies are fighting to sort of get resources to reduce their climate impact because it actually does have consumer impacts about which product they end up choosing. Um, so really what we're starting with is our, our first container. This is a, the smallest size we're, we're working with. This is really meant for medical and biopharma shipments. So these are particularly cold down to negative 25 degrees C, um, and we can maintain that for multiple days in transit. Um, we're really viewing this as more of a leasing model on the business side. So essentially giving them the same cost on a monthly lease as they would spend on a single shipment. We have more volume and obviously we can be used multiple times during that month. So as soon as you use us on one shipment, you're already, you know, 3x uh, savings. But, you know, if you use us three times during the month, then that becomes nine. Um, and the one really cool thing is, as I was sort of mentioning, along the cold chain, there's a lot of instances where something might arrive at a warehouse and there may not actually be space, even if, you know, you've already accepted the shipment. Um, and the boxes themselves can actually be used as dynamic storage on site. So yes, there's a battery pack for cooling them down while they're in, in the supply chain itself and they're moving through it. But if it arrives, for example, at a hospital or at a warehouse that actually is currently full up, you can just plug us into a wall port and we can cool indefinitely. And then the last thing is we're building in an, a full IoT platform on top of this. So you can use a phone or, or web app to then control and manage multiple units track them, see what's going on, do things like regulatory reporting through that platform, which currently have, has been like a, a whole, you know, one-off shipment that they have to do every couple of months to prove to regulatory, uh, uh, you know, advisors that we're, they're actually meeting um, standards, but they can do that 
with live data with our units. And uh, across the board, I mean, as I was sort of mentioning, everybody is sort of fed up with the way that the cold chain currently works. So everybody from like custom sale manufacturers that are shipping, you know, maybe 10 or 12 vials at a time, but they're super high value. You know, this is something sort of the end result of a project they've worked on for a couple of months um, to, you know, organs. One thing we found out that was really crazy is that 10% of all kidneys that are arriving to a major hospital in New York are actually arriving either damaged or, or in some, you know, basically have spoiled during even the couple of hours that they were in transit. So sort of across the board, there's a lot of pain points um, in terms of spoilage, in terms of being able to get more warehousing space, all that kind of stuff that we can sort of solve with a single product that really allows people to sort of ship as if it wasn't a cold good, as if it was a book or anything else. And so just a little bit about uh, our traction and where we are so far. Mark and I started working on this uh, late last year uh, and did dozens of customer interviews. Um, we applied for a Tomcat grant, uh, which we received and built our at-home prototype getting down to negative 12 degrees Celsius. Um, since then we've closed seed funding and we're using that to hire uh, a few engineers, get our manufacturing set up as well as getting set up as a B Corp. Um, right now we're set up as a public benefit corp. Uh, and we are, launch, we are planning to launch pilots in Q4 of this year uh, with a full launch uh, in Q1 of next year. Um, so that leads us to where we're at, things that we would love help from. Or if anyone on this call has ideas, we are looking for pilot customers. So we're actively recruiting pharmacies, labs, biopharma companies, or food delivery companies that might be interested in working with us. So any company that's shipping temperature sensitive products. Uh, we're actively hiring. We're Right now, we're hiring for a great thermal and mechanical engineer um, to join us at our office here in San Mateo. Um, we will be looking for an operations manager later this summer. And just generally, industry experts, if you know senior people in biopharma, clinical trials, and hospital systems that you think we should know, um, we would love to hear about that. Thank you all. Great. Thank you, uh, Hannah and Mark. Uh, First, yeah, let me just say really uh, impressive trajectories, really short, short timeline. You guys have made amazing progress. Um, maybe I'll start. Can you tell us a, just a little bit more about how the, the technology works? So, so you're, you're replacing systems that, uh, you know, basically, yeah, what is the current technology? Um, mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit more about how, how yours works for, for the market that you highlight? Yeah, so, so there's sort of two, two modes. There's um, there's either something that you might be used to from a, from a consumer point of view, if you use like HelloFresh, something like that, which is you know a polystyrene polyurethane container with a bunch of dry ice, usually for medical shipments, um, which are going particularly cold. That's 20 pounds of dry ice that they're putting in one of those boxes just to carry like 13 or so vials. Um, so that's status quo number one. Um, and then status quo number two is, is sort of the heavy CapEx investment in the refrigerated trucks and refrigerated warehouses. Um, so we're, we're sort of tackling those in, in different, uh, different products. The first one, like I said, is really meant for those lower temperature bio, biopharma and medical shipments. Then um, as we scale up, you know, we're not, especially as we're moving towards agriculture, we don't need to go as low as negative 25. So, you know, in those we're really focused more on refrigerated and, and um, and frozen um, and, you know, bigger sizes from there. Um, and then, you know, in terms of the technology itself, so the, we're removing refrigerants because we're using thermoelectric coolers. So it's just, you know, dissimilar magnetic um, uh, materials that sort of create a hot and cold side on the unit and are really, really good at cooling down very quickly. So there's not a lot of prequel time, that sort of stuff. They're not the most efficient, you know, they're not as, reason why you don't see them in HVAC systems is that they're not as efficient as a compressor, but we can sort of, um, we can deal with that issue a little bit more since we we're highly controlling the environment that it's in. So we're, we're vacuum insulating the environment. And so, you know, we can optimize our own environment to deal with the fact that we're not using compressor systems, but we're also then, you know, if this gets dropped in transit and something really does break, we're not going to be releasing refrigerants and on on anybody and have it, any hazardous material on board. So, you know, it is an added benefit there. Great, thank you. 
and and how so how big is the the system that that you that you showed for your your first product or? um yeah so that that system is, is pretty small so the goal of that is really to to fit about 36 uh standard vials inside one of those uh boxes then um the next size is if you think about it is in terms of like a large tote bag that's sort of the internal space of the next one and then the full size one is more meant for larger agricultural shipments that would head on like a pallet size. Okay. And and what sort of, uh, this is coming from one of our audience members. So what, what kind of range are you, are you looking at for, for these different sizes in terms of time and distance? And Yeah. So, I mean, with anything that, that you're dealing with, uh, with thermal, you're, you're dealing with uh, differences in longevity based off of temperature that you're trying to maintain. Right. So, you know, the difference between ambient and, the internal temperature makes a huge difference in terms of longevities. With the negative 25, I think, uh, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, I think it's like five or six days at that temperature. You do frozen, we're more at like 15. Refrigerated is like 20. And then chilled is like 30 or so days. And then, you know, as, as you uh, scale up a little bit, uh, obviously that's get, that gets a little bit worse because you're cooling a larger space. But we're also not going as low on the temperature, so we can still do about uh, about like five days at frozen, uh, even at that scale, and and obviously better once again at refrigerated and then chilled. And, and that's off a single charge. Of the that's on a single charge. Wow. And that's um, you know we're keeping under you know, the Department of Transportation has a hundred watt hour maximum for being able to uh, fly one of these units. Um, so we're keeping under that in terms of the battery pack, but um, in terms of ground shipping, shipments, um, where we know that we're going to go longer distances at, or, you know, have a longer time scale on the ground, and we know that we're going to ship only through ground, we can actually expand that about threefold. Okay. And then sort of thinking about markets and, I mean, obviously many different targets here for you guys. Um, and I understand why you're starting in the sort of bio and the pharmaceuticals first, but if you think about food, um, and you mentioned making these larger containers, what what are sort of the, the first customers? Is it, is it grocery stores? Is it sort of the, the cold chain for the for those distributors? Or and then you mentioned you know a lot of shopping, particularly in the past couple of years, has gone to you know at home delivery of groceries. I, I can't tell you how many cold packs I've <laughs> thrown out <laughs> over the past two years or so. Um, what's your business model? Or, or how do you envision going after those? Sure. Um, so on the you know food and agriculture side, we're, we're starting with grocery stores, generally then those that have integrated supply chains so that are not working with 3PLs, but are running their logistics in-house. Um, a particular interest to us are grocery stores that also have pharmacies, so that have a fairly large Rx business. Uh, within that up the chain, we're actually looking at distributors, so food distribution, anyone that's doing palletized distribution of, of produce. Um, food delivery is a really interesting spot, but also complicated when you get to the returns element, right? So getting a, picking a unit back up from an end customer. Um, we've spoken with a ton of food delivery companies, many of whom are wrestling with this on their own because they recognize customers um, dislike the wastefulness and, and it's actually a, a selling proposition for customers. Um, and so with food delivery, you know, we will get there, um, but it's something that is top of mind that it changes the business model a little from a B2B to a B2B to C model. Uh, and then to answer your question on um, the model, right, it's a leasing model right now. And so you would pay a monthly fee um, that's for access to both the hardware and the software side. And we didn't talk as much about the software um, just given the length of this presentation, uh, but the opportunity to do your emissions tracking, your reporting, the API into any database or, or federal regulation, regulatory database, as well as to help you meet business KPIs and to be able to uh, net basically um, optimize network flows and understand where and when you're shipping. Um, that is all uh, of key importance and that will be part of the leasing model as well. Fantastic. And, and then when you, when you think about sort of scaling and having a, a lot of these containers, you know, in, in a truck or in a plane or whatever, are there challenges with sort of the heat, the, the thermal management as you as you pack these together? And can you take advantage of the, of the sort of software side to to manage that? Yeah. So um, you know, we're we're being really smart on the control side, if I can say so myself. <laughs> so the, <laughs> what we're what we're trying to do is um, 
work with the best insulation possible because the best insulation possible also gives us the least amount of heat output, right? So like we're talking about an enclosed space. If you've got uh, if you've got a really highly insulated area, you have to put less power into it to keep it at that stable temperature, right? So in terms of our heat um, uh, expulsion, like we can do that with, with natural convection. We don't need like fans or anything on top. It's sort of that level of, of heat that we're sort of uh, putting out in, into the environment. Um, we've got a whole like venting system that essentially gives us uh, some air buffer room that would give us a number of hours before the ambient temperature, even in that space, gets above anything that we would be concerned about in terms of, you know, hurting the efficiency of the cooling system, anything around that. But, you know, in the long run, you know, most of these, these units are not going to be in, in situations where they're going to experience, you know, an ambient temperature beyond like 30 or 40 degrees C. Um, and we can do in most situations, well beyond 60 C and still be able to cool effectively. Um, so, you know, we, we've got a lot of buffer on that side and, and I've been, you know, thoughtful about the way that we create space around the heat, um, heat exhaust in order to um, uh, manage the fact that we might be stuck in a truck for 12 hours, 24 hours, so on. Fantastic. Um, well, I want to thank you both again for, for sharing uh, Arctic with us, and uh, I, I really wish you the, the best, and that's a really uh, exciting trajectory. So, so thanks for, for being here. Thank you. Thank you. And, and this is actually a, a, a rare occasion in the Innovation Showcase where I, I think, uh, at least it seems to me at a high level, there's a there's a potential opportunity for, uh, for two of the teams to, to maybe connect. So, so we're going from... Uh, from Arctic to uh, to uh, this, from the cold chain to wireless charging with uh, resonant link, uh, and this is we're joined by uh, Grayson Zuloff, who's the, the founder of Resonant Link. Um, so Resonant Link is developing wireless charging systems that uh, eliminate the most expensive component in conventional wireless chargers and actually improve the efficiency as well. Um, many different applications uh, one could envision, ranging from medical to transportation, just in the, the medical space, I was astonished to see this, um, this fact. Uh, so for medical devices, 5% of, uh, for implanted medical devices that, that Resident Link is targeting, 5% of the patients with those devices die each year from uh, infections from the wires or the battery replacements. Uh, so Grayson, it's uh, great to have you here. And uh, we're excited to hear about Resident Link. Perfect. Thanks so much, Professor. Um, yeah, I'm Grayson Zuloff. I'm one of the co-founders and the CEO here at Resonant Link. And just want to thank Danica, Brian, the whole Tomcat community for having us here. As, as you'll kind of see in our story, uh, it's impossible for me to extricate the story of Resonant Link, the story of kind of spinning it out of Stanford and my research from Tomcat, who actually funded me from day one of my PhD, we were supposed to build great DC-DC converters. We found a bunch of problems with these new wideband cap semiconductors and Tomcat supported us all the way through spinning this out into a company five years later. I think we've been working together for, for about six years now. Um, so at Resonant Link, we're building, uh, as Matt said, breakthrough wireless charging for mission critical power. And I think the, the short story, and I won't spend too much time here on the technology, is that we have a breakthrough innovation that fundamentally changes the achievable performance with wireless chargers. So you can think of a wireless charger, you've taken a conventional charger and you've pulled apart that transformer, put a big air gap in the middle, and now you need to figure out how to recreate the performance of a transformer that's actually coupled together tightly. So those are what, what people some call antennas, the coils, basically the things that convert the electrical energy into that magnetic field to go across the air gap. So we have a fundamentally new way of building these coils that actually my co-founders invented at Dartmouth College called the MSRS. And these get five to 10X lower losses than conventional technologies. So we can do five to 10X faster charging, we can do bigger air gaps, smaller sizes, better misalignment, higher efficiency, and lower cost, all of the above. So it's a great technology, rare to get 
kind of this order of magnitude improvement in hardware. We demonstrated this at Stanford uh, with Tomcat support. And then we sat down and we're like, oh man, does anyone actually care about high performance wireless power? Um, so I still remember the day we demonstrated this in Juan's lab, my PI's lab. We went to Coupa and we were like, okay, let's list all the places where we could use wireless power to PhD students. They were like, okay, consumer electronics, and eh, that's, that's kind of a weird one, let's color it in red. Um, okay, induction cooking, that's basically wireless power, maybe we'll use that. And then my background's in commercial electric vehicles, that's actually how I got excited about it originally. You can see we're like, okay, maybe a Roomba, Roomba could use wireless power. Um, and then we have big question marks, medical, underwater, clean room, lighting, all of the above, trying to really figure out where people actually care about high performance wireless power. I think we're lucky now, uh, four years since we founded the company, to have determined that wireless power is important for places where you need mission critical power delivery. So we're working across a number of different markets where people have known that wireless power would make a huge difference, but haven't been able to deliver the performance that they need to have it make sense for these. So we go to the medical device market, you know, people have been working literally since 1965 to get wireless power to certain uh, products here and just haven't been able to deliver the efficiency to eliminate the wires and save thousands of lives every year. In consumer electronics, it was Apple's first ever publicly announced product that was subsequently canceled uh, because wireless power is so hard. People want to go to portless phones, but it's really difficult to get the charging speed in this limited form factor. Then we go to EVs, kind of why, why I'm here for, for the climate impact. How can we accelerate electrification through wireless charging? But it's just too expensive to deploy beyond ultra luxury EVs today. Um, and these are huge opportunities, right? Medical is about a billion dollar charging market, all the way up to, to tens of billions of dollars in the electric vehicle market to find broadly. And I think today, after many years that we're making progress and we're winning every single one of these markets, making wireless charging the default for the next generation of medical devices, consumer electronics, and electric vehicles. Um, so in medical devices, we actually just last week crossed double digit customers. And this is just one case study from one of our biggest customers here. So again, 40 years of development, $25 million spent with competitors at the end of the day, just holding the bag with a product that was 10 times too hot to ever get FDA approval. We just delivered the alpha units. We've been working with them for three years now eight times lower implant losses, completely eliminated power conversion stages, integrated data into the wireless link. And this huge company's principal engineer saying, this wasn't our first attempt, which is kind of the understatement of the century. It'd been 40 years of attempts. Um, 20 internal team members, I think 70 came to our last milestone presentation. Five other competitors nailed every milestone. They're going to market and we're growing in this medical field to truly make implantables. And there's more and more things inside our body that are electrically powered to make rechargeables the default solution there. There's really no excuse why our pacemakers, neurostimulators, heart pumps, insulin pumps should not be wirelessly recharged for a non-invasive way to deliver power. In smartphones and consumer electronics, you know, there's been a lot of press about how inefficient wireless charging is there we get two to three times lower losses uh, with a drop-in replacement. Same electrical characteristics, same mechanical characteristics operating at the standard. And you can see here on the right, it's the thermal image for a conventional phone and for a, a conventional coil in a phone and a resonant link coil in a phone. And you can see if ambient's 25 degrees, it's about twice as high at the same power level. So we've got wrapping up uh, studies with some of the leading smartphone OEMs in the world and moving that toward commercialization. And I'm hoping you'll see a resonant link charger in your phone in less than two years, uh, paving up the way toward portless phones where we can have fully sealed phones with wireless charging that's as fast and as efficient as our wired chargers today. And then the big ones, EVs, our goal is to get 
uh, small batteries on EVs with 24 seven uptime for these fleets by integrating charging into the short stops that already exist during operation. So we're starting in the warehouse space there, lift trucks primarily, forklifts and other, other styles of that vehicle, and then growing into this autonomous vehicle and electric vehicle world with a high power charger that's coming out later this year. So we're working with people like Shell, like NREL through the Game Changer program, the Air Force, and a number of leaders in both the tier one, tier two world, and then in the electric vehicle and autonomous vehicle world to get this deployed. And again, you can see how much smaller our systems are, much lower losses, much lower costs. And I believe this one also has 30% faster charging. So that, that order of magnitude hardware gain is, is deployed differently in different applications, but it's, it's uh, uniquely powerful in each of them. Um, we're, we built an amazing team. We just crossed 30 people all fundamental scientists uh, on the founding team. And we've kept growing that. People have left Tesla to join GE, uh, Apple, Plug Power, people graduating from with their PhDs from Stanford, ETH, Michigan, professors at Harvard Medical School. We're really trying to build a team that's committed to delivering on the promises of wireless charging and truly delivering on the promises uh, within the bounds of physics here unlike some of the, the promises that we've seen in the last decade. Um, so really building the future of mission critical power, we have uh, double digit enterprise customers that we're lucky to have trusting us to power their next generation of devices and vehicles. We're backed by some incredible investors. We closed our seed round um, at the end of 2021, led by the engine with participation from some great investors, Scout, Emerson, Volta, Third Sphere, and Urban Us, and Fresh Tracks Capital. And we're really, we've, we're the, the trusted recharging player in the medical market today. And we're really excited to bring that and see what we can do to have a big impact on climate in the mobility market. Um, so I'll stop there. And yeah, we're building breakthrough wireless charging for mission critical power. And Always open for uh, for people that are excited about wireless charging and are hiring uh, really across the team today. So Tomcat, thanks so much for the support and thanks for having us today. Grayson, thank you. That was awesome. Uh, really amazing to see uh, all the progress there. So uh, I, I guess I, I want to start. So the you told us how you know the industry's been trying for four years to to make this happen. Um, your device looks so simple. What can, can you give us a sense of what the breakthrough was? It was it a design concept? Is it a, a materials innovation, or what? What was the what was the nature of the breakthrough to make this possible? Yeah, absolutely. So most people build these coils with something called Litz wire, which is this multi-stranded conductor that's braided together, and they basically wrap that in a loop and then attach it to a separate capacitor. And what you want to do with Litz wire is the performance goes up as you make each of those strands smaller and smaller, but the cost goes up exponentially. So basically you're stuck around hundred microns, depending on how much you're willing to pay. And we can, with these foil layers, we can build them in single digit micron thicknesses. So you basically have that similar mitigation of proximity skin effects, but with a hundred X smaller conductors, you can call it. And so it's, we're, it's some materials because we're combining the inductor and capacitor into a single block, but really the fundamental driver is getting a much thinner strand diameter, you could call it for Let's Wire. Okay. And, and so the, the, what are the major sort of challenges? I mean, you, you showed all of these, um, all of these potential markets. Uh, is the challenge really in sort of manufacturing and, and scaling the manufacturing or, or is it do you basically already have the design concept you need for the EV and it's, it's just a matter of, of, you know, getting the other side to get the compatible hardware so you can start rolling this out? Yeah, so I think we spend most of our time trying to answer that question that I started with. Where do people really care about high performance wireless power? Like where can we make the biggest difference? And then figuring out which of these metrics we should be optimizing. Is it size? Is it speed of charging? Is it efficiency? You know, what, what should we be building towards? So 
it's takes we're relatively fast at kind of changing the platform application and size and power levels. Um, and then it's you know basically putting the time in with OEM since we're asking for OEM level integration. So people want to see the proof points, they want to kick the tires, they want to play around with that. Okay. And and it's uh, I guess presumably it's it's easiest to get traction sort of with the medical devices because the the products are smaller and uh, and I, I guess the the price point's much higher for those for those applications as well. Yeah, I think in medical devices, you know, the it's in some ways the hardest place to get traction, right? Like we're literally powering hearts. People don't turn that over to a startup lightly. Um, I think the reason we're trusted there is because people know wireless power is literally life or death. It's a huge quality of life thing for their patients. And then they don't have internal resources um, and they, they don't believe they have the ability to attract people to build great wireless charging systems. So someone like um, Abbott and Medtronic are amazing at everything in medical devices, but they don't have you know, a dedicated wireless charging team like you might see in the consumer electronics world or in some of the other markets that we work in. Um, so we're someone that helps them get to market faster with less risk, more likely to be successful and in the end deliver something to their patients that uh, improves our quality of life. And and how, so how well aligned do, do, do the components have to be for for charging in these in these systems? And, yeah, it really depends on the market. Like in EVs, we have you know up to a 10 inch gap and six inch misalignment. In something like medical devices, you're looking at centimeters, uh, like up to six centimeter implant depth, a few centimeter misalignment. And there you're really trying to make it easy for the patient to align it, but that's a lot different use case than it might be for you parking your car, say. So we really optimize it based on, on the application. And, and the, the charging frequency in a medical device, would, what does that look like? Yeah, in medical devices, it's all over the map. Uh, and so something that we've spent a lot of time is optimizing the frequency. You wanna go higher to get better wireless charging performance, but you have to balance that with that you get more tissue losses at a higher frequency. So there, you know, optimize is in the megahertz range, uh, but then some customers are above that, some are below that, and we work with our customers to optimize that for their application. And, and how often would the patient need to need to recharge? Really depends on the application. So some of our customers say, we don't want any batteries inside the body. We need continuous power. Um, and others, you know, like a pacemaker, you're only needing to recharge uh, in on the time scale of years. Um, and then we have ones on months and weeks and days, uh, kind of everywhere in between. Okay. And just from a sort of uh, business level uh, question, so I, I, I know you you have locations in multiple cities, and and you're chasing um, obviously multiple very very different markets. You showed you know incredible team you've put together. Um, yeah. how, how do you keep everybody? How, how do you manage that right? And 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 how do you you sort of run in parallel uh, for all those different applications in different parts of the world? Yeah, I'd be lying if I said it was easy. I think we're one of those companies that is trying to see what this future of remote and hybrid work might look like and while building a hardware product. So we have lab headquarters in Burlington, Vermont. We've got people all over the world uh, with hubs in San Francisco and Zurich and then a number of fully remote teammates. And so we're doing the best we can trying to build a great team great culture and, and doing it while letting people live where they want. And, and uh, the idea is that, so you would, um, you will manufacture all of your, of your own hardware ultimately, or, or would you eventually go to some contractors to? to yeah, start? we, we have partners on the coil side and then we work with contract manufacturers on the electronic side. Okay. Um, well, Grayson, this has uh, just really been a, a tremendous uh, success story to watch, uh, certainly from the from the Tomcats perspective, and uh, it's uh, it's really inspirational to hear about 
uh, everything that you're going after today. So, uh, so thanks, thanks so much for sharing that with us. Yeah, thank you guys for the support. It's been, been foundational. Okay, so our, our final team uh, is called uh, Working Trees. And so now we're, we're transitioning to uh, a very different technology uh, going after carbon credits and carbon removal. Um, Working Trees is really trying to uh, deploy trees uh, as a carbon uh, removal entity where the interests of farmers and climates, uh, where the interests of farmers and the climate uh, overlap. And uh, we are, uh, so just a, a, a couple of, of interesting facts to sort of set the stage for them. First of all, the, the median farming operation in the US uh, is losing money. <laughs> um, so, so farming is a, is a, a very challenging business. Um, there's a, uh, the, the voluntary carbon um, credit market has, has blossomed in the past two years. It's tripled in the past two years to, su to surpass, uh, surpass $1 billion. Um, so this is really where Working Trees uh, sees a, a, a tremendous opportunity to, uh, to find something that wins, that's a win for, for farmers uh, and, for, uh, and for the climate as well. So, uh, so John Foy and Akash uh, Ahmed are, are the co-founders of Working Trees. And thanks for, for being here. No, thank you. Thank you for having us. And thanks to Tomcat for all the wonderful support since the, the very early days. So we're happy to be here and grateful to be here. Uh, my name is John and I'm a, a dual degree graduate student studying land use and agriculture plus getting an MBA. And my co-founder Akash is here. He's a PhD in geophysics and, and remote sensing. And we got together about a year ago with uh, a shared interest in trying to uncover, okay, trees get so much press and tree planting in particular, you see in newspapers almost every week. But when you look at the facts, it hardly happens at all, certainly not at scale. And as we've gone through our, our exploration with the support of Tomcat, um, we've founded Working Trees with the mission of, as Matt said, growing trees where the interests of farmers and the climate overlap. Um, we think there are ways to address the barriers that are preventing it from happening at scale. And now that we're a couple hundred uh, interviews in, many hundreds of interviews with, with farmers, we're at the point where we've launched the first agroforestry carbon project in the U.S. And uh, we're happy to tell you more about that journey so far and, and where we're headed. So to start off, um, I do think it makes sense to just quickly walk through what is a carbon market to make sure we're on the same page. Um, I'm sure all of us have heard of a company that has made a net zero commitment. This means there's a date by which they plan to get to effectively zero emissions. Companies will first do that by becoming more efficient, reducing their own emissions. But for nearly all companies, there's some amount left over. And at that point, they can pay other entities to pull greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere for them. So all, that transaction is all a carbon market is. And we've spoken to... Uh, a couple dozen buyers and their two big takeaways on, on the needs they have in this market. The first is quantity. Um, as, as Matt alluded to, uh, it's exploding and actually demand is exploding and there's no way for these companies to actually source the, the volume that they need to hit their commitments. And the second is quality. The biggest fear they have is that um, they'll end up on the front page of Bloomberg with a greenwashing claim that the money they put into a project didn't actually drive real climate action. Now, at the same time, you have to make it work for the farmers that manage the majority of the habitable land on Earth. And in our many hundreds of conversations with farmers, two, two big takeaways on, on the needs worth noting. The first is financial. As mentioned, uh, typical farms, even in the US, really struggle to break even. Um, and the second, because farmers are on the land, uh, they're most exposed to environmental um, extremes, things like extreme heat, changes in precipitation pattern, patterns. The good news is, amazingly, uh, incorporating trees into agricultural systems actually addresses the needs of both buyers and farmers. On the buyer side, um, on, quant on the quantity uh, need, agroforestry is actually the largest agricultural climate solution we have. And there is a, uh, an actual 
practice, a particular practice of agroforestry called silvopasture, which just means planting trees on pasture, that leading carbon think tank Project Drawdown has sized on par with rooftop solar. So this is not a small uh, niche application. This is massive because there are billions of acres where, where this can be done because pasture is the, the, and livestock grazing is the largest land use in the world. Second on quality, uh, buyers can rest easy because if they can use uh, satellite imagery to look back a couple of decades and verify that a particular piece of land has been uh, cropland or pasture land for decades, they can know that the money they put in in terms of carbon finance is what actually drove um, action. On the farmer side, uh, financially, if you can uh, enable farmers to tap into carbon revenue, that can make them whole. And environmentally, trees have uh, a wonderful set of benefits that can be provided to farmers. Big ones for uh, livestock uh, growers are shade and feed, but they also include things like greater water retention and infiltration, as well as improved soil health. So uh, sounds too good to be true. Uh, so now we have to dive into why this isn't happening today. And honestly, the big reason actually has to do with cash flow. So in order to establish trees, say trees on pasture, it costs hundreds up to $1,000 per acre uh, to get trees in the ground. And yet the benefits we just talked through, whether it's shade, feed, or even theoretically carbon, are years in the future. Now, this is interesting because maybe you can use some financial engineering with carbon in order to overcome this, um, this cash flow imbalance, but that does not work with how markets work today. It costs a, a ton of money to go out and quantify how much carbon is stored in these systems. How it works today is boots on the ground, usually two separate crews are going out with clipboards and a tape measure. And so I'll hand it over to Akash to explain how we, how we fix these problems. Thank you, John. So given that farmers are walking their lands anyway, you know, almost at a daily cadence, we saw a significant and unrealized opportunity to equip them with the tools that they need to acquire the measurements needed to estimate carbon sequestration in a cheaper and more efficient and equally as accurate way as the status quo. So farmers acquiring these measurements themselves eliminates the cost of the manual monitoring and verification that John just mentioned. Uh, and those cost savings can go back into the pockets of farmers and also benefit working trees. Moreover, the data itself is a competitive advantage. More data can improve our ability to remotely sense uh, carbon stocks in these types of ecosystems and move us toward a fully remote verification solution, which creates kind of a self-reinforcing flywheel. Now, by providing financing through forward-looking purchasing agreements, we can incentivize the farmers to take, agroforestry, take on agroforestry projects at zero down and realize their benefits, both in terms of revenue, production, and the ecosystem service co-benefits that we just mentioned. So we've started to develop our technology with uh, the support of Tomcat and other grant funders. Uh, and so here you're looking at some screenshots from our application, which is nearing uh, a first release. Um, and so what it does is provide a way to cheaply and accurately measure the parameters that you need to estimate woody biomass carbon. These parameters are tree height, tree diameter, and the species type. And we can use these along with satellite data to cheaply and accurately extrapolate carbon estimates over large areas. And so by using the app instead of the manual measurements, uh, we dramatically reduce the time and cost without sacrificing accuracy. And we also have this very highly auditable and transparent data set, which makes our buyers feel good about the credits that they're buying, uh, that they're real. So this is super exciting, but is it scalable? Let us look at the total market sizes for the carbon credits in the US and as well as agroforestry projects. So as Matt mentioned, the market size for carbon credits has tripled in the last three years alone, and we're likely to see uh, continued price appreciation. Uh, and, but even with current market prices, there's still a sizable opportunity uh, in the US here. Upwards of two and a half billions of dollars in the US agroforestry market alone. Uh, and as John mentioned, we're targeting a specific agroforestry practice called silvopasture, just the practice of cultivating trees on pasture. And we're looking at the U.S. Southeast as our first target market due to strong local connections and the added bonus of a favorable climate for fast tree growth. So at a high level, this looks promising, but everything really starts on the ground with the farmers themselves. So it's really my pleasure to introduce you to our partner producer, Lick Skillet Farm. They're a family-owned operation more than 100 years old, located in Jefferson County in eastern Tennessee. They run cattle, grow chickens, and grow other ag products. 
And they're incredibly passionate about being stewards of the environment and doing their part in the fight against climate change. And they're also excited to be the project ambassadors for us as our first pilot producers and kind of realize the benefits both in terms of economics, core production, uh, as well as the ecosystem services that Trees on Pasture provide. And their collaboration and support will allow us to tap into the network effect that's so strong among farming communities. Uh, so to provide you some additional details about the business model, I'll hand it back to John. Thanks, Kosh. So uh, the first step is how do, we, how do we find the millions of lick skillet farms that are out there? And we kind of think about this in two steps, awareness and the decision process. On the awareness side, Akash alluded to some of it, which is um, farmer to farmer is huge. We, we're already seeing that with our, our pipeline buildup for the next season, uh, next planting season in early 2023. Uh, but we also are going through trusted networks, including Cattlemen's Associations and the USDA, as well as extension programs. Um, once farmers are aware of the benefits, uh, the next step is to decide what and how to plant. And at this point, we're really happy to say we're developing strong partnerships with technical service providers. You can think of these folks as consultants to, to farmers and ranchers. Um, and we've signed up a massive partner in Virginia Tech Extension, as well as a handful of other for-profit uh, TSPs. And uh, I definitely want to highlight this because we think this is how we get to scale, not necessarily us going door to door, farm to farm, but uh, working with folks who already have strong relationships and connections. And quickly in terms of uh, how, how you uh, convey the value prop in, in terms of economics, there's probably too much on this slide for, for how much time we have, but the key point here is we can make this at $0 down for the farmer. This is for a representative farm, 400, uh, excuse me, 300 acres. Um, there's a bit of uh, cost, as we mentioned, to begin with. This is more than offset with uh, incentives that are in place from the USDA, as well as uh, the carbon forward contracts that we mentioned. And so for this particular farm, it's actually a net payment up front. Um, and we think this is what will unlock adoption at scale, much in the same way guaranteed offtake and power purchase agreements worked for rooftop solar. Now, our business model is to take a 25% revenue share on all carbon payments. And so, um, yeah, it also works out and creates value for us. In terms of the competitive landscape, there's a lot, there's a lot here, but we are the first carbon uh, agroforestry project in the US. And um, so we're the only ones that run project development and monitoring and verification, particularly for agroforestry pro projects. Uh, just to point out our differentiation versus some of the uh, measurement monitoring and verification players that you may have heard of like Pachama and Silvera. Uh, we're innovating by collecting the ground truth data that we think is crucial for running high quality, high accuracy carbon projects. Because um, without that, you're guessing on things like uh, species and wood density and the different morphologies of different trees. So I think even in that space, it's a differentiated approach. And with that, I'll hand it back over to Akash to bring us home. Thanks, John. So we're really excited about this. We are united by a shared passion for both evoking positive change, both in terms of climate change and in terms of rural economic development. John and I both have previous startup experience and super complimentary skill sets, uh, him being an MBA student and me being a technical minded person. Um, we have an incredible team of advisors at Stanford, NASA, the University of Maryland, and one of the world's leading silvopasture scientists at Virginia Tech. Uh, and we're super excited about our growing number of partner farmers in the US Southeast. So where we are right now, um, we've launched the first agroforestry carbon project in the U.S. We've planted more than 500 trees in the last few months in Tennessee and Arkansas. We have a guaranteed buyer who's agreed to offtake the credits that we're going to generate. We have a fully functional phone app capable of measuring out everything that we need to measure. Uh, and with the support of Tomcat, we will be certifying our project with a carbon registry to take the next step this summer. So briefly, just to summarize, agriculture is the largest land use on earth and nature-based solutions like silvopasture have a huge and unrealized mitigation potential that we are working to scale up. So we're really looking for help connecting to corporate buyers looking to purchase high quality carbon offsets. And we're also looking for potential funding opportunities. So thank you so much for your attention and we're happy to take any questions. Thanks so much, uh, John and Akash. Awesome teamwork on the presentation as well. So um, maybe I'll start with the, with the big picture. So, um, and, and I, I think you, you touched on this, but um, the total opportunity in terms of 
of tons of carbon removed and and so what is that if we just confine ourselves to the us and then and then how many trees basically how many trees do you have to plant and and what's your what's your timeline uh, you know how quickly do you want to be able to 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 get there yeah so in terms of the potential just in the us for um for silvopasture alone you're looking at close to 200 million tons okay. um so it's sizable and that's limited to pasture that is in locations that were historically forested um there's almost almost 100 million acres that that meet that criteria then when you go global uh the potential impact of, of silvopasture alone is a uh, multi-gigaton per year uh approach and i do want to emphasize our, our approach, we're prioritizing civil pasture for all the reasons Akash mentioned, but it will work for um, other agroforestry practices, including things like alley cropping, which you can basically put rows of trees within um, annual crops or riparian buffers, things like that. Um, yeah, and, and in terms of the, 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 the scale of the trees, I guess it's it kind of implied in the, the 100 million acres here in the US. And depending on the installation of, of civil pasture, you may do 50 to upwards of 100 trees per acre. Okay. Okay. That's what I was yeah. getting at. Yeah. So, so when you, when you sign a farmer on, um, they, they, let's say they have a couple hundred acres, you're, you're looking to get that person to commit to, to thousands of trees, I guess, ultimately on their, on their land. Is that, that's good. Yeah. And just to give you, to give you the image, you aren't, it isn't a full forest for sure. uh, a lot of reasons. You need to keep the grass. So maybe 25 to 50% canopy coverage is where you want to end. Okay. And then the the monitoring. So so, can you give us a little bit more insight into the so the the farmer has to go out twice a year or something like that, and they have to go treat a tree or what, what what's what's involved with that? Yeah. So our app actually designs a little sampling routine for the farmers to uh, collect the measurements. Uh, and yeah, actually the status quo is they currently acquire measurements. You know, go out with clipboards and tape measures every five years. So we're actually asking the farmers to go once a year uh, and it takes about a couple of hours, three to four hours to acquire the amount of measurements that we need to be to drive reliable estimates. Um, so we think we have kind of a higher frequency and higher quality and more auditable measurement system that's not too burdensome on the farmer uh, and their time as well. And the, and the app knows, I guess, just from the GPS, the, the species of the tree that's being, so the farmer doesn't have to, to enter any data about the tree when they're going around or? Yeah, so they, they collect the measurements. The, the species of the tree uh, is in our systems, we have the uh, benefit of knowing it beforehand since right. we're planting the trees. Uh, that said, we're also working on an automated tree identification system just to verify that, uh, you know, the species that we think are there are in fact uh, correct. Okay. Um, so working on that. So just from, from images and some yes. sort of machine learning or? So exactly, exactly. Okay. So the farmers uh, take the measurements that they need. They also capture images of those measurements and images of the tree trunk and the foliage. Uh, and then we have a backend machine learning system that verifies that uh, the tree is in fact the species that we think it is. Okay. And then from a, a verification point of view, so so you mentioned the satellite. Are, are you interfacing with satellite data as well? Not, is it, and I guess what I'm getting is, you know, how do you know you know the trees that are planted? How do you know that there's not other land use changes on the farm that would sort of undo the the carbon that's being you know captured by the trees that are that are planted with working trees? Yeah, this is this is core to why we focus in on the potential for agroforestry because you aren't actually asking for changes in land use. So there's there is no reason why you would do anything like change change your stocking rate, stocking density. Okay. Um, and in terms of uh, I guess ongoing monitoring with individual farmers, there is kind of a, a survey process we have to go through to comply with the um, voluntary carbon market standards methodologies that we're using. So we'll collect the information like that uh, through that process. Okay. And can you comment on on sort of traction with the the companies that you showed, showed some really big companies that that are you know looking for uh, you know, looking for carbon credits that you know looking for the quantity and the quality uh are you are you getting traction with those or how do you how do you present this yeah i mean we have like like akash said we have a we had a guaranteed buyer for our pilot who's looking to uh ramp up for the next year so um that that's wonderful in terms of some of the very large buyers uh 
we aren't yet at the scale where we could right. meet some of their RFP requirements, but that'll be changing with the 2023 planting season. So stay tuned. Okay. And then uh, last question, um, and this kind of relates to other, um, uh, you know, another Tomcat uh, program this year around solutions and uh, focus on tropical deforestation. So, um, you know, we've, we've heard from uh, a number of outside experts uh, who participated in Tomcat events. Uh, of course, as you know, um, cattle and agriculture are, are driving tropical deforestation. And, and in many cases, it's, it's small farmers who are, who are clearing forest land, you know, for new pasture land or new agriculture. Have you, is that on the, on the horizon? Is that, is that an ultimate target to try to use something like this to disincentivize and, you know, basically create a, a um, alternative to, uh, to what's clearing, uh, you know, to, to the drivers that are clearing tropical forests today? Yeah, we think there, there's a number of ways we can expand our application to support um, in that way. So one, one is we are starting with agroforestry as the tool gets more and more sophisticated, it can be used for all sorts of forest inventory. Um, I think very directly to the question you, you had about uh, say grazing lands and, and pasture in South America, if we are able to increase uh, profitability through other channels, then it certainly decreases pressure uh, and expansion. And crucially, um, you can do this while still maintaining um, maintaining pasture land. So you aren't necessarily planting trees and then just pushing cattle further into the forest. Fantastic. Um, well, I want to uh, I want to thank John and Akash and and all, all three of our teams again for uh, j just a really uh, phenomenal afternoon. Um, I I also want to point out uh, we have a, a Tomcat Center LinkedIn uh, group that uh, we encourage everyone to join. That's a that's a good way to connect with these teams. Um, feel free to uh, to reach out to us if you would uh, like to. And and Donica put the the LinkedIn connection. Uh, on the chat as well. Feel free to reach out to the Tomcat team uh, if we can uh, help connect you further with uh, Arctic or Resonant Link or Working Trees. Uh, and also feel free to, uh, to reach out to our presenters uh, directly. So, so thanks so much uh, for everyone uh, for being here today. And we hope to see you at another Tomcat event uh, very soon.